In his book, World as Will and Representation, the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer argued that music better conveyed emotion than any other art. A painting could convey a sad person or a sad event, but only music can convey sadness itself directly and unmitigated by any objectual representation. Schopenhauer presented several arguments for this position, but chief among them was the simple fact that music moves us deeply and involuntarily, stirring up not only emotions but actions as we dance and sing along with the tune. The fact that music compels our feelings and our behavior makes it seem a little bit magical, and where there is magic, there is the possibility for horror. And so, we will focus on the arcane, even eldritch power of music as we sketch out our adventure today. Welcome to phd and everyone, I'm Dr. Bowers, and today we're going to discuss the Ravenloft Domain of Dread known as Kartikas. As with my other Ravenloft Domain videos, we're going to go over what Kartikas is, describe some media that help us get an imaginative grip on Kartikas, and then sketch out an adventure. In this case, the adventure occurs across five acts, and it will take PCs from level 8 up to level 13. That is, they will complete the adventure at level 12, and then level up to 13 at the end. So let's get started. What is Kartikas? Well, Kartikas is a vast stage that serenades the ambitious with promises of fame. Performance is a way of life in this forested domain, with everyone from the Bards of Skald to the actors of Emhurst pursuing dazzling dreams. Here, the people live by a simple rule, never let an audience grow bored. In Kartikas, individuals strive for glory. Where talent and expertise fail, obsession and duplicity reign, leading to repeating cycles of triumph, betrayal, and despair. Predators of all sorts flourish in this land of consuming passions and vicious secrets. With each full moon, the truth of Kartikas is exposed, and lycanthropes reveal their hunger for dominance and for blood. Kartikas is a land full of music and characterized by music, to the point where everyone is a musician and each town is ruled by a meister singer or a master singer. It is, in addition, a land of lycanthropes, werewolves, or in the second edition, wolfwares. Far from taming and soothing the savage beast, in Kartikas, music attracts it. Now the association of music with magic and the arcane is a very old one, and so there are many different sources we might draw upon in order to get an imaginative grip on this place. The first is the myth of Orpheus, a Mycenaean hero who was a bard, a musician, one who sang so well that he was able to gain entrance to the underworld simply by singing, one who sang so well that even rivers stopped flowing to listen to him, the wind stopped blowing to listen to him, and even the stones of the earth would roll up hills in order to get closer to him to listen. For a source, I would recommend The Death of Orpheus from Book 11 of Ovid's Metamorphoses, an epic poem that contains and retells many ancient Greek and Roman myths. With poetic language, Ovid conveys not only how the entire natural world stopped to listen to Orpheus, but how, upon Orpheus's death, it tore itself apart in grief. These same stories about Orpheus are wonderfully summarized and even illustrated in Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths from 1962. In addition to myths about Orpheus, there are also myths about the Pied Piper, and this is a horror story unto itself. The basis for the Pied Piper myth lies in mysterious monuments dating back to the 14th century strewn across Central Europe. Stained glass windows, engravings on archways, and old chronicles all attest that in the year 1284, a mysterious piper showed up and took over a hundred children away from a village. Scholars have ventured several possible explanations for these monuments, including emigration, mass psychosis, and the last remains of a Roman slave trade, and it is from these monuments and conjectures about them that the modern tale of the Pied Piper arises. And here I would recommend two different stop-motion animation films. The first one is simply The Pied Piper of Hamelin from 1981. This one is narrated by Robert Hardy, who reads the entirety of Robert Browning's poem The Pied Piper of Hamelin, which was first published in 1842. The other version is a stop-motion film from Czechoslovakia in 1986 called Krishar, or Ratcatcher. This version renders the tale of the Pied Piper in a German expressionist style with a sickly color palette, the use of taxidermied rats in the production, and a grim gothic soundtrack featuring not only orchestral strings but heavy metal guitar and synth. It is absolutely a horror movie and well recommended if you're going to write adventures set in Kartikas. It's also worth looking at the European genre or theme of art known as the Dens Macaw, whose visual adaptations gained popularity around the 15th century and whose musical adaptations gained popularity around the 19th. There's also the short story of H.P. Lovecraft, The Music of Eric Zahn, published in 1922. In this story, the arcane power of music is the one thing keeping an eldritch horror at bay, one which, as is typical for Lovecraft, cannot be described or even fully comprehended. 
I also recommend the 1986 film Crossroads. This is an adventure film with some light horror elements. And it's inspired by the legend in which the American blues musician Robert Johnson allegedly sold his soul to the devil at a crossroads in order to gain musical talent. Now, in fact, Robert Johnson is not the first American blues musician who was the subject of such a legend. The original subject of the legend was Tommy Johnson, unrelated, another blues guitarist and singer who you might recognize as being represented in the film Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? In Crossroads, a young music student from Juilliard breaks an old blues musician out of a nursing home in order to journey across the Mississippi Delta, learning how to play blues, learning about the culture of blues, and eventually competing in a guitar contest against the devil himself for the soul of his friend. It's not a perfect film, of course. Despite advertising itself as a tribute to the blues, the final conflict is won not by blues, but by Western classical music. <laughs> But it is definitely worth watching as an inspiration for Kartikas, since it's an adventure film. It features the young bard, the wise sage, the rogue, and it's all about music. I also recommend the 1990 computer game Loom by LucasArts. This pixelated point-and-click adventure game replaces the usual puzzles involving inventory items and objects with puzzles about music. Indeed, Loom has its own magic system where magic is based on music, and you cast spells through sequences of notes. One sequence of notes, for instance, might cause something to burst into flame. And if you want to put a fire out, you just play that same melody backwards. Playing a musical spell backwards will accomplish the opposite effect of whatever the spell does. Of course, some spells are palindromic. They're the same notes backwards or forwards, so those spells are permanent and cannot be undone. If you like designing magic systems or thinking about magic systems and you want one that's uniquely musical for your Kartikas adventure, I recommend at least looking at Loom. I also recommend a couple of moments in the Disney film Hocus Pocus, one where the witch Sarah calls children to a certain part of the town by singing, and another well-beloved scene when the three witches put on a performance of I Put a Spell on You and cause a room full of adults to dance and dance forever. And speaking of harmful music, it's also worth taking a look at that scene from Kung Fu Hustle involving the musicians who slice their opponents to shreds with the power of their harp. The very notes that they play act like edged weapons. Similar representations of musical sounds as weaponry occur in Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and the Battle of the Bands, and also in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness when the titular character fights one of his variants. I also recommend the 2015 novel Signal to Noise by Silvia Moreno-Garcia. This is a novel about childhood friends who learn how to cast spells through music by listening to the right spell and channeling their emotions and their intentions into the music. They work miracles. Unfortunately, the magic is unpredictable, and when you give that kind of power to hot-headed teenagers, all kinds of disasters happen, and thus the plot unfolds. I also highly recommend the anthology of short stories called Welcome to the Show, published in 2018. This is a collection of short stories, all of which are horror stories, and all of which take place in a single music venue, The Shantyman. Every one of the stories is fun and could be an inspiration for an adventure in Kartikas, but I especially enjoyed Night and Day and In Between, a story where an altercation at a music venue becomes supernatural, Wolf with Diamond Eyes, a story about what happened on a certain musical band's last performance and why so many people died, Dark Stage, where a musician performs something at open mic night which causes a supernatural effect, and We Sang in Darkness, a band finding themselves trapped in a music venue with a caged monster, and things only get worse when music is introduced to the situation. Close to the end of the list is the 1990 second edition Ravenloft adventure Feast of Goblins, which is set in Kartikas. The adventure's first half especially is full of events and NPCs and maps, which you might want to appropriate for a Kartikas adventure. And finally, I do have to recommend my own work, Group Spellcasting Concerts. This is a simple, optional rule set for 5th edition, which explains exactly how groups of PCs could cast spells together through Charisma performance checks. It was given an excellent review by Rogue Watson, and I'll put a link to that in the doobly-doo. And if it seems interesting to you, please go ahead and pick it up. It's just a couple of bucks, and it will support the channel. Alright, with inspirational media out of the way, let's sketch out our adventure. In Act 1, the PCs at level 8 find themselves in the Wildersong woods of Kartikas and face an Orphic monster. In Act 2, at level 9, the PCs encounter musical dangers on the road to harmony towards Skald. In Act 3, at level 10, the PCs are ambushed in Skald and rescued by Harkon Lucas. In Act 4, at level 11, the PCs suffer a horrible trick by Harkon Lucas. And finally, in Act 5, at level 12, the PCs face Harkon Lucas in a final confrontation. So let's begin. The adventure begins with the PCs finding themselves in the wilder-sung woods of Kartikas after a fog envelops them on the road. 
The PCs do not know where they are when they arrive, but they should notice that they are suddenly in another land. The temperature has changed, the air pressure has changed, even the songbirds and the constellations in the dusky light have changed. Take note that it is autumn and golden and orange leaves are slowly falling to the ground. Allow your PCs to react to the change, and then they get attacked by eight monsters. These monsters have the statistics of harpies, but we're going to describe them as looking like wolves who bay and sing in a mesmerizing manner. We'll say that the harpies' luring song trait, in other words, is just their continual howling, and we'll change the bludgeoning damage from their club attack to piercing damage and describe it as a bite attack instead. Now these monsters have nothing of value on them, but up ahead on the road the PCs should find a dead body, the body of some adventurer, and it is interesting for several reasons. First, although the body has been mostly eaten and chewed away by wolves, it still has balls of cotton lodged in its ears. More such cotton can be found in the corpse's pockets. Furthermore, the corpse carries a note on which is scrawled a desperate warning in common. The warning says that these woods are home to a horrid creature, the Wilder Singer. This creature's song is so beautiful, so terribly beautiful, that all of nature stops to listen. Rivers stop flowing, autumn leaves stop falling mid-descent, even the wind stops to listen. Anyone who hears the song will be paralyzed by it, the note warns. So it is crucial to deafen oneself in order to survive, either with magic or by putting something in one's ears. Now shortly after the PCs read that note, they hear a song floating on the wind. It's a melodious mixture of human singing and lupine baying. Have them make a charisma save with a DC of 18. Anyone who fails is paralyzed for a minute. Because the PCs are not in combat, that minute should pass rather briefly, but it should be a warning as to what's to come. The PCs will need to deafen themselves, either by putting some cotton in their ears or by casting silence or some other way. Now, no matter which direction the PCs travel, the sound gets louder and louder. Eventually, the PCs come across a 30-foot wide stream which is frozen in mid-flow. Not frozen as in turned to ice, simply frozen as in not moving. PCs can walk across the river as if it were solid, but it is difficult terrain, and whenever a PC first steps onto the river or starts their turn on it, they must make a DC 15 dexterity save or else fall prone, taking 1d6 bludgeoning damage. Now, on the other side of the river, high up in a tree, the PCs can see the Wilder Singer, a cadaverous, werewolf-like thing perched atop a tree and throwing its head back in song in just such a way that it seems to be swallowing the full moon like those sky-flung wolves from mythic folklore. Between the riverbank and the treetop where the Wilder Singer rests, there's a collection of autumn leaves frozen in midair by the Wilder Singer's song. If PCs do not have a climbing speed or a flying speed and they want to get up to the Wilder Singer and get into melee with it, they can climb on those autumn leaves. Moving up the leaves is difficult terrain, and every 25 feet a PC must succeed on a DC 12 dexterity save or else plummet to the ground, taking bludgeoning damage. So there's a horrible wolfish monster up in a tree baying a toxic song, and PCs will need to climb on falling autumn leaves like steps in order to get up there. It's great! As for the Wilder Singer's statistics, we're going to start with a Nosferatu from Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft and change a few things. We're going to add the Harpy's luring song feature, but bump the DC up to 15, and we're also going to give it a ranged attack, which are blasts of music. It'll be a plus 9 to hit, just like the claw attack. It'll have a range of 120 feet, and it will inflict thunder damage instead of the claw's slashing damage. We'll also change the Nosferatu's blood disgorge attack into something called Crescendo, a singing music attack. It still recharges on a 5 or a and the damage is the same, but we'll say that the damage is psychic rather than necrotic, and instead of preventing the target from regaining hit points if they fail a DC 16 constitution save, we'll say that the target falls prone if they fail a DC 16 wisdom save, and falling prone if they're on the autumn leaves includes falling to the ground. We'll also give the Wilder Singer three uses of legendary resistance and three legendary actions. It can spend one legendary action to make an attack, or it can spend all three to recharge its crescendo ability. When the PCs defeat the Wilder Singer, the river starts flowing again, the leaves fall, no longer capable of holding anyone's weight, and the PCs love up to nine. Just at that point, they see a break in the tree line, opening up to a road, and there's an ideal spot to make camp nearby. Once they do and they level up, we proceed to Act 2. In Act 2, now at level 9, the PCs are on the road to Harmony, heading north towards the town of Scald. You can have a road sign direct them that way. As they tramp the road, they encounter a group of traveling bards headed the other direction, from Scald. They challenge the PCs to a contest of performance checks, best three out of five. Whether the PCs win or lose, at the end of the competition, the bards will reveal themselves to be werewolves, transforming into their hybrid shape. If the PCs lost the competition, then the werewolves will attack immediately, but if they won the competition, the werewolves will spare the PCs' lives, asking only for their belongings instead. 
Of course, the werewolves will attack if the PCs refuse to hand over their belongings. Later that night, wherever the PCs decide to make camp, they suddenly hear a ghostly song. As the song plays, a dozen skeletons rise up from the ground and begin to dance, and with them, six wraiths. Along with the skeletons and the wraiths, there dances the source of music, a ghostly antique phonograph player with a huge horn resting on an attached cabinet. The phonograph is actually an undead creature. It has the statistics for a skull lord, except its speed is zero, it has a flying speed of 30 feet plus hover, it does not have the spellcasting feature, and it does not have multi-attack. And finally, its master of the grave trait should be described as the ghostly music it's emanating. Now when these undead creatures appear, at first all they do is dance around to the music. This doesn't harm the PCs in any way, but it does prevent them from resting, even taking a short rest. The undead ignore any attempts at communication, but they all become hostile at once if the PCs in any way interfere with their dancing. If the PCs attempt to leave, then each one must make a DC 18 dexterity save to avoid bumping into any of the undead or jostling them as they leave. A failed save means that someone was jostled and all the undead attack. Finally, if the PCs together join in with the dancing, they each get a level of exhaustion, but they also get a point of DM inspiration or heroic inspiration. Assuming the PCs survive the night, they reach level 10, and we proceed to Act 3 as they arrive in Scald. In Act 3 at level 10, when the PCs arrive in the bustling city of Scald, they see an overwhelming number of art projects and public performances, especially musical performances. For encounters, I might use the encounter table for the lower districts of Baldur's Gate from Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus, and just make sure to add a musical element to each encounter. At some point, a well-dressed stranger approaches the PCs and introduces himself as Maestro Darius. He will welcome the PCs to the town of Scald, ask them how long they've been here, where they've come from, and explain that he owns a little music venue called The Shanty Man. Because he cannot afford to book the most famous or expensive acts, Maestro Darius instead books new ones. He especially likes to find strangers from out of town and have them show off their talents on his stage. He asks the PCs to come to The Shanty Man that evening and show off their talents in exchange for a considerable amount of gold and also a place to rest. For The Shanty Man, you can use the theater from page 74 of Waterdeep Dragon Heist, and you should say that there are about 10 patrons in attendance. The patrons are initially indifferent, maybe even skeptical, but they can be moved to enjoyment or to booze depending on how the PC's performance checks go. Towards the end of their performance, Maestro Darius will interrupt everyone, say that they've had enough light entertainment, and now it's time for dinner. At that point, every audience member transforms into a werewolf in its hybrid form, and half of them attack immediately as the other half rush to guard all the exits. Maestro Darius spends the first round of combat laughing, and then turns into a werewolf in its hybrid form in the second round and joins in the fray. Towards the end of this fight, an older man, a bard, crashes through the window and fights alongside the PCs. It's Harkin Lucas. Lucas remains in his human form, and in this form he has the statistics of a Silver Quill Professor of Shadow from Strixhaven Curriculum of Chaos, who can grant a d8 of bardic inspiration to a PC as a bonus action. You should make sure that Lucas is useful, but that he doesn't overshadow the PCs. Have him heal the PCs, buff the PCs, help secure an escape, but don't give more narrative or descriptive attention to him than to the actual PCs. As they escape together, if he hasn't already, Harkon Lucas introduces himself. He tells the PCs that he has a safe place to hide out, and that they can trust him because he's an old adventurer too. As he leads the PCs to his own music venue, the Old Kartikan Inn, the PCs level up to 11, and we proceed to Act 4. Act 4 begins at the Old Kartikan, a failing music venue that belongs to the once famous Harkin Lucas. The establishment is entirely empty except for one drunken customer asleep at the bar which nobody is tending. For a map, I would use the Elf Song Tavern from page 17 of Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus and just add a little stage in front of the fireplace. Harkin Lucas offers the PCs food and drink and beds, and he answers their questions about himself, the land, and talks about how he used to be a famous music star. He conceals the fact that he is a lycanthrope, but he does warn the PCs that lycanthropes are everywhere in Kartikas and that the unwary traveler can easily get killed. Once the PCs are rested and have talked with him, he makes them an offer. Scald is just now beginning its annual series of music festivals, some of which are competitive, and he wants the PCs to represent the Old Cartican in the music festivals. In exchange, they can call the Old Cartican home and treat it like a home base. They can use it for whatever they like, for as long as they like, and he will split the considerable prize money with them. He also adds that, knowing the town of Scald, he will be able to keep the PCs safe and prevent anything else like what happened in the Shantyman from happening again.
again. Assuming the PCs agree, Harkonnen whoops with joy and then eagerly gives each PC a necklace. On each necklace hangs a wolf's tooth that has been dipped in gold. Harkin tells the PCs that the necklaces will keep the PCs safe from lycanthropy and guard against werewolf attacks. In fact, he's lying. Putting on the necklaces actually confers lycanthropy onto the PCs. It turns them into lycanthropes, in other words. If the PCs put them on, they won't notice any immediate change, and they won't be able to tell that they're under any magical effect. The necklaces have been guarded with a magical aura that prevents detection, and right before this conversation, Harkon actually cast Mind Blank on himself using a scroll or a magical artifact. In this interaction, Harkon Lucas should seem genuine in his concern for the PCs. He should not seem to have an ulterior motive, although he does, and you should try to genuinely make the case that these are good necklaces that'll protect you from werewolves. There are werewolves everywhere. Wear these. Now once the PCs put their necklaces on, Harkin instructs them to go to a tavern called the Violet Violin. He says that tavern is a good one and it's still in need of performers, and if they show up, they should be able to perform. For a map of the Violet Violin, I would use the Blue Water Inn from Curse of Strahd on page 99. Have the PCs perform at the base of the stairs. Their performance should begin at dusk, and everything should seem to go well, but midway through the performance, two armed men will burst through the door, point at the PCs, and yell, It's a trap! before attacking them. These two men are monster hunters, and they each have the statistics of an Inquisitor of the Mindfire from Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. They do not reveal this, but the monster hunters showed up because they sensed the PC's lycanthropy. Now, at the battle's conclusion, when the monster hunters are either dead or have run away, it is well past nightfall. And just then, a passing cloud unveils the light of the full moon, which shines through the window onto the PCs. Describe how the PCs' vision blurs, their skin itches, their clothes don't feel like they fit right, and they fall to their hands and knees before everything goes black. When the PCs regain consciousness, it is early in the morning. They do not have the benefits of a long rest, and indeed, they have a level of exhaustion. Each of the PCs is naked, covered in blood, on the floor of the Violet Violin, and surrounded by the gory remains of all the patrons of the Violet Violin. The gory remains are half-eaten, and each of the PCs should have the taste of blood and flesh in their mouths. Give the PCs some time to react to this, and to panic, and to wonder what they should do, before the front door opens, and in strides Harkin Lucas, whistling a happy tune, all smiles. He greets them good morning, congratulates them on a job well done, and urges them to wash up and get back to the old Kartikan while he takes care of things here, cleaning up the mess and collecting the valuables. At that point, the PCs level up to 12, and we proceed to Act 5. Act 5 begins with a choice. Do the PCs continue to work with Harkon Lucas and his murderous agenda now that they know that they are lycanthropes? Or do they confront Harkon Lucas and try to defeat him? Or maybe they try to escape the town and run away? or maybe they try to inform the town's authorities about Lucas. Regardless, at this point, the PC should be able to discover, either through Harkin Lucas telling them or through other means, that they are lycanthropes and that there is no cure save for killing off Harkin Lucas. Lucas openly admits deceiving the PCs and turning them into lycanthropes on purpose. He says, In show business, you gotta be extreme if you wanna be a star, and that means lycanthropy, baby. That's show business. Now, if the PCs work with Harkin Lucas, have a few more encounters like that of the Violet Violin. The monster hunters who inevitably show up to slay the PCs will get more and more difficult, and Lucas will get more and more greedy with the resultant loot and more dismissive of the PCs' concerns. This should eventually build up to a confrontation. If the PCs try to inform the authorities about Harkin Lucas, they will be unable to find anyone who takes them seriously. Everyone knows who Harkin Lucas is, everyone knows that he's an old has-been who can't even keep a tavern clean, let alone kill a man. At the very best, the PCs should prompt some kind of tokenistic, flippant, dismissive investigation that takes Harkin Lucas Lucas's testimony for its word, and disregards the PCs. If the PCs attack Harkin Lucas, they would be wise to take a long rest first, since at the end of the Violet Violin encounter, they still had a level of exhaustion. They can, of course, take this rest at the old Kartikan. Finally, if the PCs attempt to flee Scald, Harkin Lucas will realize that they have left, and he will track them down. Within a couple days' time, he will catch up to them, find them on the road, and confront them there. So regardless of what the PCs choose, it is very likely that this adventure is going to end with a confrontation with Harkin Lucas. When the PCs fight him, he will shift into his hybrid form, which has the statistics of a Lou Garou, but with maximum hit points, and also the Siren's Luring Song feature with a DC of 15. On initiative count 20, Lucas can summon 2d4 plus 2 wolves? and he has a magical connection to them, so that he can transfer his wounds to them whenever he gets attacked. This should keep the PCs from ignoring the minions and just focusing fire on Harkin and then ending the encounter as soon as possible. When Harkin Lucas is reduced to zero hit points, there is a hush that falls over the land. Complete silence. For a moment, the first ever such moment, 
there is total silence in the land of music. And in that moment, a gloomy gray mist arises from the soil and swirls around the PCs. If the PCs wish to stay in Kartikas, they can of course flee from the mist, but otherwise it envelops the PCs and spirits them off to their next adventure. So that's our adventure in Kartikas. What do you think? Do you think the adventure places too much emphasis on the PCs being able to do performance checks? If so, how would you change that? And what do you think of Harkin Lucas being an old fuddy-duddy has-been of a Dark Lord? I think it's a fun subversion, and it allows for the PCs to be put in such situations as being werewolves themselves and being horrified at what they have done. You'll also note that I didn't get a chance to include the Crystal Club. Would you have included it, even though it's all the way over in the other town of Harmonia? Let me know in the comments. Thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to do all the internet things. Click like and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell icon if you want updates on this channel. And thanks very much. Also, happy birthday to this channel, which is now one year old. To commemorate the occasion, I'm going to have a special announcement in the very near future, so stay tuned for that, and happy Halloween.